Sam says, let's get started. Got it. Okay, so welcome attendees and um, uh, folks to the Gettysburg Review, Willow Springs um, reading. We're really pleased that uh, Gettysburg Review was willing to work with us on this and we're excited to hear what they have to bring forward. And, um, and thank you, Sam, for running uh, the board. And I will hand it over to Mark to announce our first reader. Thanks, Polly, and thanks, Sam. Um, much appreciated all the work that you, that you did to put this together. Uh, I, Lauren and I are both very thankful that we didn't have to do the tech end on this one. So um, thank you very much for having us. Thanks also to the readers who agreed to do this. And first up for us tonight is Christine Schott. Um, Christine teaches literature and creative writing at Erskine College. She holds an MFA in creative writing from Converse College and a PhD in medieval literature from the University of Virginia. Her essay memoir, Bone House, appears in the current issue, which is issue 33.1, I'm sure you can't see this very well, but here it is, uh, of the Gettysburg Review. And it's her first published essay. Um, so we were very proud to, uh, to be the magazine that first published one of uh, Christine's um, pieces of nonfiction. So without further ado, everybody pre please welcome Christine Schott. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And I'm really grateful to Willow Springs and Gettysburg Review for putting this event together and inviting me to be a part of it. So I will be reading from the beginning of my um, essay in the Gettysburg Review. Bonehouse. One. Anglo-Saxon verse is much more eloquent than high schoolers reading Beowulf generally realize. The Anglo-Saxons cultivated a rich tradition of metaphorical compounds or kennings. Bird's delight means feather, the whale road, the sea. A breast hoard is the emotion a good warrior keeps pent up inside until it forces its way out in the form of a lament or elegy. The human body is the bonhus, a bone house. I don't think I understood the mortal power of that kenning until my own bone house was broken. Two. The x-ray after the accident answered a twisted kind of math problem. What happens when a minivan going 35 miles per hour strikes a hundred pound graduate student? In my case, the sum was one concussion and a pelvis broken in three places. I have forgotten many things about the event, but I remember coming to sprawled on the pavement with a woman stroking my forehead. Battered and concussed, I asked where my left sneaker was as it had been knocked off by the force of the impact. Someone fetched it from the gutter and ensured that it went with me to the emergency room. Those two strangers offered me the few humane comforts they could. Three. When the EMTs arrived, they strapped me into a cervical collar, but when they straightened me out to put me on a backboard, I gasped at the sudden pain in my pelvis, then I blacked out. In that period of unconsciousness, I remember a strange disembodied feeling. I didn't have to wake up if I didn't want to. I could sink or I could rise, it was up to me. But then I became aware of the fluorescent lights flicking past my closed eyelids. And like a swimmer too buoyant to stay down, I bobbed irresistibly to the surface. That was a last choice offered to me for many days and it wasn't really mine to make. I woke up on a gurney being wheeled through the hallway. From then on, I belonged to the hospital. Four. Only when I was left alone long enough to perform a mental inventory did I realize my body no longer felt like my own. I had a grossly swollen hip, road rash, and blood caked in my hair. My elbows didn't bend smoothly, and I felt I was moving my legs by remote control, distant and clumsy. Anytime I twisted or bent, I felt broken potsherds grinding against each other inside me. The first time I tried to lie on my side, I felt like an egg cracked and prized open to spill into the pan. I cried in fear and despair until someone came to help me move. The concussion brought on waves of dizziness and for at least a week, I couldn't turn my eyes to the left without them beating back and forth the way they used to when I got off a merry-go-round. Being in my broken body was like walking into a house that survived an earthquake. Everything was still there, but nothing was where I left it and nothing worked the way it used to. I spent months putting my furniture back where it belonged. Five. 
It wasn't just an internal sense of displacement. Once I had been admitted to the orthopedic care unit, I learned that it made very little dis difference whether I was awake or unconscious, and I had the impression the professionals around me preferred the latter. Patients who are awake cringe when you poke them with needles. They complain about being roused at four in the morning for rounds. They push the call button for help when they want to sit up or go to the bathroom or put away their meal tray, be cleaned up when their medication makes them vomit on themselves. Patients who are awake are more complicated. We are taught gratitude. Gratitude for what might have happened but didn't. Gratitude for the doctors and nurses and surgeons who piece us back together when what did happen happens. By we, I mean people in general, but particularly women. We are taught gratitude, and in general, it isn't a bad lesson to learn. We have many things to be grateful for. I have many things to be grateful for. And yet, and yet. Six. As emergency faded into recovery, I began to notice that I stiffened with hostility every time a white coat entered my room. The emergency happened so fast, I mainly recall it as a rush of activity around me, the eye of the storm. I was helpless to act or even be particularly distressed. In recovery, I remained the passive center of a brisk professional movement, but my mind caught up and wanted to be a person again, only I couldn't be, I was broken. Thus, it was in recovery that I discovered to my bafflement and shame that from the depths of my humanity, I dislike doctors. I've now met a number of surgeons and in each of them, I have found a professional machismo of sorts. When they're helpless to fix something, they treat it with a cavalier air but my offended personhood growls that they would hardly be so casual if they were the ones who had to live with brokenness. Soon after my release from the hospital, I, my left ankle swelled and swelled until it looked like a club foot. I needed five minutes just to stand up in the morning because putting weight on my leg was like standing on a balloon overfilled with boiling water. Then quite suddenly, I developed a shooting body convulsing pain of sciatica. I was readmitted under suspicion of a blood clot and put through a battery of painful tests. One of these was an angiogram, during which they threw a sterile sheet over my head and used my face as a table for instruments they weren't using. Seven, we are taught gratitude and we are also, also taught patience. By we, I mean women. It never occurred to me to ask the surgeons to stop setting things on my face during that procedure. They were professionals and if they had to lay that coil of tubing on the sheet, that's where it had to go. It, I had no right to complain that my head happened to be underneath it. Legally, I was a person, but in that moment, like every woman at some point in her life, I was an object. When they had trouble staunching a bleeding artery, a scrub wearing assistant, nurse, intern, dug his fist into my groin to stem the flow until it clotted. It was very uncomfortable. That's not pain, that's pressure, he told me when he saw my face. They had taken the sheet off by this point. It occurred to me to offer to drive my fist into his groin and see whether he changed his mind, but I didn't. My role in the medical drama did not involve sarcasm. It was best if I didn't say anything at all. My part was to lie still and embody both meanings of the word patient. Eight. Based on the electromyogram, they concluded that my sciatic, sciatic nerve was not injured. Dressed and sitting upright, I had regained enough dignity to speak. So what's causing the pain, I asked. Dunno, they said. Nor did the angiogram reveal a blood clot. I had sympathetic nerve damage meaning my blood vessels couldn't contract, so my leg flooded with blood and fluids. Will it get better, I asked. Dunno, they said. I relapsed into silence. It did get better, slowly, by the working of nature and not of medicine. But for a few months, I was a 23-year-old looking at being lamed and in racking pain for the rest of her life. I'll never forget that feeling, and I'll never forget the doctors who shrugged it off because it wasn't their body. Nine. Old stories are full of people who are damaged and are never the same afterward. After Beowulf tore off Grendel's arm, there was no recovering for the maimed outcast. The Norse sagas are full of kettle flat noses and Thorolf lame foots, nicknames commemorating the injuries that marked their biking bodies for life. Horses have often been fate's instrument of choice for bodily damage. Henry VIII was injured in a jousting accident that permanently affected his leg and some scholars think may have caused a brain injury that turned him into the madman we know from history books. William III, also of England, broke his collarbone falling from his horse. While laid up with the injury, he contracted the pneumonia that killed him. Half a decade after breaking my pelvis, I started down the same path as William on his ill-fitted ride, and I do not ignore the fact that had I been living in William's day, my story may have ended as his did. 10. 
Never trust a chestnut mayor, the old saw goes, even one called Greenpeace. When she bucked me off, the impact was so stunning I thought I had broken my pelvis again. I didn't realize there was something wrong with my arm until my riding instructor, who propped me up against her legs, tried to rub my left shoulder. Ow, no, I gasped. We are eloquent in our pain. Liz helped me peel back my jacket. I touched my shoulder gingerly and recoiled when I felt the end of my collarbone sticking up just below the skin. 11. Left alone momentarily as Liz moved away for a better signal to call an ambulance, I felt the soft touch of a velvet nose on my helmet, which I hadn't taken off. I looked up into Greenpeace's long, curious face. She's apologizing, Liz called from a few yards away. People who don't know horses would dismiss such sentiment, but I believed her. Greenpeace had only been in high spirits when she kicked up her heels. We are taught not to blame the horse for a fall, and we are also taught to call it a fall regardless of how violently we are thrown. By we, I mean all riders. Ask any of us. It's probably the only lesson I have never rebelled against. It may have to do with the touch of that velvet nose. I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Heiki Hotari. Uh, in a past century, he attended a one-room school and spent summers on a forest fire lookout tower. He's a retired math professor and has published poems in numerous literary journals, including Crazy Horse Pleiades, the American Journal of Poetry, as well as in three collections. A fourth collection is in press. Hakey's chapbook, Tooth and Shoe, was published by Willow Springs Books as part of the Surrealist Poetry Series. And uh, he is in our newest issue, just about out, um, 87. You're seeing the proof of it here, first time reveal. Welcome, Heike. Hakey, um, can you unmute and turn on your video, please? It's in the left-hand corner. So perhaps um, we could move on and then come back to Hickey so we can figure out what's going on with his um, technology. Um, we can go on with... Um, So who would you like to go next, Polly? Do you want yeah, me to that's what I was trying to determine. <laughs> um, how about A.D. Nauman? Unless you want uh, Juliana to no, go. No, that works, that works. Let's, yeah. Let, I still think we should alternate. So let's, let's just okay. do it that way, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, yep, yeah, I, can, I can go. Thank you. Um, okay, so A.D. Nauman uh, has published short fiction in Tri-Quarterly, Necessary Fiction, The Literary Review, Roanoke Review, The Chicago Re Reader, and many other journals. Her dystopian novel, Scorch, was published in 2001 by Soft Skull Counterpoint. Nauman is the recipient of an Illinois Arts Council Literary Award, and her work has been produced by Stories on Stage, broadcast on NPR, and nominated for a Pushcart Prize. She lives in Chicago with a very pampered tuxedo cat, and she too is in this issue. Thank you. Let me see how I can get on speaker view here. Okay. 
We see. I'm on. Yep, got it. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much to Polly and the other organizers for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. And um, what I'm going to read is the first five pages of the short story that's in that issue of Willow Springs called Lookers. It's I hope you're it's I hope it's not too jarring from the one you just heard. It's it's quite different. Um, OK, again, it's called Lookers. It's important to know that. OK, <laughs> I'm hearing bells. It's important to know that it's set in the late 1970s in a town called Newport News, Virginia, where I lived as a kid. OK, Lookers. Jenna sat in the back row like she used to in high school and eyeballed her, Lou Ann, the original WRNL good looker, up front sitting straight as a board with her glossy flowy mahogany hair down to her waist, Lou Ann, all swishes and smiles, snug in a pink blazer, turning to grin encouragingly at the girls behind her. Born to be pleasant Lou Ann, with no history of schizophrenia or alcoholism in her family. This was the kind of girl guys liked, beautiful, but not too intense. Jenna must have been chosen for a contrast. Jenna's hair swelled in loose curls and her lips took up too much room on her face, her jawbone so steep it cast black shadows on her skinny neck, yet everyone said she was gorgeous. The other good lookers were all blondes, with slow blinking Bambi eyes and teeny noses planted in the center of Valentine faces. Luann and Jenna were the only brunettes, which was probably why they got paired up. Big D sat on a metal desk up front and talked at them in his radio voice. The job was to ride around town in the WRNL winter wagon and give away free money. It was Big D's idea to hire luscious young girls and call them good lookers. They were to search with cars for men in them, as the good looker concept did not seem to apply to women, then pick a car and radio in a description and the license plate number, which Big D would broadcast between oldies. Big D paused to ask if anyone knew how to work a CB. Only Jenna raised her hand, but it was the other's ignorance that delighted him. He continued, if the lucky driver was listening to WRNL, he'd know to pull over and get a free 50 bucks. The girls were to jump enthusiastically out of the winter wagon and run in their high heels to the lucky car. Big D demonstrated how they were to run, holding their arms out from their sides like ladies, not balling up their fists and jogging like guys. Big D did not look like his radio voice. He was old and had that wormy kind of fat on him with splotches on his face that went all the way up over the top of his cue ball head. When one of the blondes asked a question, Big D gripped his chest like her beauty was giving him a heart attack and pretended to faint. Then he hopped up and yelled, ask anyone girls, they'll tell you I am one crazy dude. He never did answer the question. Jenna would have liked to get a long piece of cord like a clothesline and twist it around Big D's neck and pull it until his fat spotted head popped off. Probably it wouldn't pop so much as squish off and splutter down his chest with veins and other stringy stuff trailing down the nubby fabric of his shirt. At the end of orientation, Big D left the room walking backwards, bowing and wiping pretend tears from his eyes. A secretary with lumpy legs brought in their schedules. No one got to work full time. Big D had hired too many girls. The pay would be dirt. Staying at the Pizza Hut would have been better. But working here, Jenna would get to wear nice clothes and hear her name on the radio and feel more real. Luann slipped into the chair beside hers and murmured, listen, I say we walk to the lucky winter car and hold our arms however we like. Jenna squinted her face in a fake smile. Luann was one of those girls who's assertive on the sly. Jenna would have liked to pluck the big pen out of Luann's hand and jab it into her eye socket and watch the blood gush out of her dumb, surprised face. Luann leaned closer, peering at Jenna's copy of the schedule, even though she had one of her own. 
And Jenna got a close up of Luann's faultless bronze Greek looking profile. Luke would have called her stunning. Jenna tilted away from the flawless presence. Stunning, he would have said, not because he was a flirt, but because he always found a compliment for people. His image flickered in her mind, smiling and nodding, hair flopping forward, perched on his car hood with his guitar, fingers stretched along the fret. Happy-go-lucky Luke, a guy who liked everyone and everything. I'm sorry, his voice said again in her head, the breakup on instant replay, sometimes whispering, sometimes loud. I have to move on. You're beautiful, but too intense. Even someone who liked everything couldn't like her. The first day out in the winter wagon, Luann drove. It was 50s Friday, which meant every third song Big D played was extra stupid. The winter wagon was practically new, a 77 Chevy with an AM FM radio, but the radio had to stay on WRNL all the time. And Big D was always on telling dumb blonde jokes, selling discount furniture. WRNL sang a chorus of black sounding white women followed by the babbling Big D. Your oldie station in Newport News, Virginia. They drove. Luann began singing along with the radio. Oh, baby, baby, it's a wild world. Jenna had never heard worse singing. Her eyes landed on Luann's hands, gripping the wheel responsibly at 10 and 2, her nails sensibly short and coral. Jenna and Luann had not been actual friends in high school, but Jenna knew all about her. Luann lived in Riverside in a huge brick colonial with a second garage for her dad's boat. Jenna lived across Warwick Boulevard behind the Burger King where the homes were clumped up together like little green monopoly houses. Luann had been an honor student, president of the Kiets. Her older brother was one of the guys killed in the car crash on graduation night, but the brave Luann had come through it, knew how to do that, went around talking to adults, went to family counseling with her parents, then went off to college and came back talking smart with a boyfriend in pre-law. We have to find someone, Luann said, flashing a smile, her bangs like a woodblock on her forehead. How about him? They approached a Cadillac. No, Luann answered herself, already rich. She only wanted to give money to appreciative poor people. Him? Mm, no. Jenna watched the ruffly yellow sleeve flap over Luann's shoulder and was reminded that now she had to go buy fluffy dresses like Luann's. Big D had not liked the black miniskirt and sequined high heels she had on today. His eyes went up and down her front and his throat gurgled, but then he frowned, declaring she was yummy enough for an afternoon snack, but they were after a more innocent look, feminine and cheerful like Luann's. Luann was Big D's favorite. She'd stood next to him after the meeting and spoke softly in his ear, which caused him to cock his head like a dog and pant. Luann giggled, apparently taking this as flattery. And now Jenna had to be more like her, a proper little virgin type. Not a real virgin, of course, but the type who only sleeps with a long-term boyfriend instead of a series of three-week boyfriends, though Luke had stayed with her for six months. Time to move on. His cool voice cracked in her head. Big hearted Luke, such an eager, eager listener, nodding and spurting out sympathetic noises that encouraged Jenna to talk until she told him the whole entire story of Joe McKenzie, which she had never told anyone. It's okay, Luke kept saying, stroking her hair. Go ahead and cry, it's okay. But it wasn't okay. He'd gotten tired of her. Who wouldn't? Luann began, began calling in descriptions of cars. Jenna had to show her how to use the CB and tell her the makes and models. All Luann could figure out was what color they were. It took a while to find a fool listening to WRNL, but they got one, a guy in an ancient Chrysler. Jenna made Luann award the prize money, not wanting the bother of getting out of the van and walking in the weeds by the roadside. 
Luann came flouncing back all pink with excitement. Their first lucky winner was a fireman whose wife just had a baby. God. All right, I will stop here and hopefully you'll read the rest in the journal. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, A.D. <laughs> nice singing, by the way. <laughs> uh, next up uh, will be Julia Alicia Case, um, who is also in the Gettysburg Review's latest issue, volume 33, number one. I should say that we've sold out of the physical copies of this issue, but if you'd like a copy, we do have digital versions available. Anyway, Julia Alicia earned her MA from the University of California, Davis, and her PhD in fiction from the University of Cincinnati. Currently, she teaches creative writing and digital literature at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. She has had work appear here in the Gettysburg Review, of course, Willow Springs, Blackbird, Crazy Horse, The Pinch, The Writer's Chronicle, and other journals. You can learn more about her writing and scholarship at www.julialiciacase, one word, dot com. So everybody, please welcome Julie Alicia Case. Thanks so much, Mark. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited to be part of this event. It's really awesome. I'm going to be reading from the story that appears in the Gettysburg Review. I'll just read the beginning of it. It's called Taking the Blacksmith, and it's about online gaming. Um, here we go. Taking the Blacksmith, day one. In the game, we were high level and fierce, and we were nearing the blacksmith. The trees were dead or dying, the water pink with the blood of our enemies, the sky its familiar corpse gray color. The beasts rumbled under the earth, and it felt like home. At two o'clock, Tessa said. Medic, Ali said. Got him, I said, feeling the thrum in my palms from a shot well taken. Fucking A, said the fourth player, assigned to our group by the whims of the server, his voice as cold as the toppled anvil. Is everyone on this team a fucking woman? In the real world, the basement cinder blocks supported my back and my childhood bed sat firm under my legs. The room was too small and the bed was too small, but it was better than nothing, better than a car, better than a friend's futon. The broken intercom on the wall buzzed and crackled, meaning dinner would be ready soon. That winter, I'd begun to notice vibrations below the house, deep in the earth, thick pulsing tremors. I listened and imagined the shapes that could make such grumbling, the bulbous heads, the muscular backs, the blind white eyes, I might never have heard them if it weren't for the game, where the beasts were old and fat with authority, primacy. At the end of each match, they erupted from the ground to devour the losing team. Maybe they'd always been in the real world too, lurking under us, leaking saliva through serrated teeth. Once I'd noticed, I couldn't stop noticing. As I pressed the buttons, moved the joystick to swivel the camera, the tremors shook the world of the game as well as my room, the walls I'd once painted pink, now faded and pale. On the screen, we circled the ghost tree, draped with cobwebs of moss. We snuck through the reeds and arrows pierced the air, leaving trails as thin and silvery as rain. Behind the shed, Tessa said, she lived in unimaginable Florida, but even there, the beasts gobbled the muck, their scales slick with mud and swampy water. Get the goddamn hunter, Ali said from somewhere in Montana. The beasts were so close, ravenous and cruel in the silence between her words. My fingers froze on the controller and Tessa's breath caught. She was so far away. We were all far away. And what would we do when the beasts broke through? I'm hit, I said. Hunter at three now. Could everyone hear claws scratching their foundations? The entitled devouring of the soil? The beasts weren't hungry, but they would eat us anyway. Motherfucking bitches. The voice tunneled into our ears through our headsets. Insta loss every time. Our pixelated selves screamed. They spasmed in the dirt and water. The reeds turned red with our blood and the beasts burst through the ground, puncturing our armor, gnawing our weathered limbs while the flames took the blacksmith's shanty, rising gold against the frostbitten sky. Fat cunts, every last one of you. The voice was as cold as the river, as coiled as the beasts lurking under our feet. Our headsets clicked with the emptiness of him going offline. Our fingers shook as we wound the cords around our controllers. We'll get it next time, Tessa said, into silence so thick it swallowed my yes. Upstairs at the table, my mother set plates of chicken salt and baka, and our knives flashed. The dishes rang when we struck them with our forks. On the far side of the table, my father's chair sat empty, 
And we imagined his knives and the black of his eyes. We imagined his words falling leaden on the table. Imagine those words falling heavy on someone else's table. Pictured him telling someone else the things he said to us. Things like, you can't help being stupid and you're the unstable kind of crazy. Somewhere another woman flushed with shame or we like to picture her shouting back, saying biting phrases we had not been brave enough to say. Beyond his empty chair, the lawns of the neighborhood stretched flat and wide, green grass fenced with stained wood. In the game and deep in the earth, the beasts tracked us, tunneling through topsoil, rubbing, rubbing their leathery hides against sewer pipes and cinder blocks. That man I met is taking me to the movies on Friday, my mother said, and we chewed our food and glanced out at the houses that looked just like our house, pictured other tables shining with candlelight and warmth. My mother imagined those other tables were nicer than her table. She had granite countertops installed to compete with those hypothetical countertops. One hand polished slab would have eased the collection envelopes that arrived shouting my name, would have been worth whole months of slicing other people's deli meat, my hands cased in slim plastic gloves that I tossed in the trash and imagined drifting in the ocean, choking turtles. But her eyes shone with hope and we did not talk about luxury goods or stable health care, did not talk about job rejections and student loans. Outside the other lawns promised parties and pinatas, croquet games and barbecues, bright gleeful gatherings on firm stable ground, dirt filled only with pipes and basements, flat earth with only more earth beneath. Another day. We were still fierce and still taking the blacksmith. Our boots slid in the mud, the buckles metal and glinting and badass. We were badass too in our rooms, sitting on our beds and desk chairs with our hooded sweatshirts and blankets and chipped nail polish. I was sneezing and I held a box of tissues between my knees. The trees were still dead, the water sluggish. The donkey still chewed the dry grass around the well and did not wince at my sneeze. Bless you, Tessa said. Gesundheit, Gesundheit, Ali said. Thank you, I said. Score, said the fourth voice, droning distantly like a lawnmower. I'm on a team full of women. Six o'clock, Tessa said. It looks like they're in crescent formation. Seriously, Ali said, who still uses crescent formation? Such a hot voice, the fourth said. Hey, medic, say something sexy. The cinder blocks at my back trembled. Fever flared behind my temples. Got the hunter, I said. Medic at four. Hot, said the voice. Are you single? The warrior, Tessa said. Get the warrior. When the wood splintered, it splintered from our arrows. The blood in the water was not our blood. The cries of the dying were not our avatars crying. Behind the walls, the beasts hung suspended in earth, their bulbous eyes twitching. On the wall, the broken intercom buzzed. You mind if I ask, medic, what's your bra size? The voice said. Are you curvy? You sound curvy. On our screens, his bulk loomed in the doorway. His muscles looked like our muscles. His face held the same chiseled features as our faces. Are you planning to help? Tessa said. You could take out that warrior. God, said the voice. I love when women tell me what to do. The resurrection timer counted to zero. And when the branches parted, the faces were not our faces and the hands were not our hands. Arrows flew, flew through the air like silver rain. The death cries rang out in our avatar's voices. The water turned dark with our blood. You asshole, Tessa said. Motherfucker, Ali said. Yes, the voice said. Keep saying it, yes. Upstairs, my mother could eat no meatloaf. She checked her lipstick and stood in the hallway, turned to catch the swirl of her expensive skirt. I just want him to be kind, she said. I don't even care if he looks like his photo. His car pulled up, looking like every other car. The brake lights shone like all other brake lights. I thought I would know the sound of her closing the passenger door, could pick it out from a horde of closings by anxious women, hear it over the hum of 100 idling sedans. I'm gonna skip forward and read one last section. So many goddamn days. There was no world where we were not fighting to take the blacksmith. The sky was always the color of plaster, never green or violet or blue, just as our avatars always wore gray or brown or black and never red or orange or pink. Sometimes Ali sneezed over the headset, and sometimes Tessa sneezed, and sometimes the male fourth voice paused in his explanation of how to take the blacksmith, even though we were already taking the blacksmith, to sneeze, and often afterward we all said bless you, because that was what people said. We could not stop the words from leaving our mouths, in the same way we could not stop taking the blacksmith, or stop the beasts from devouring the losers, or stop our own sneezes. We tried not to think about the debts we owed, the ones we had accepted because it seemed like there was no other way but to accept them. We tried not to think about the job interviews and how we felt so sure of ourselves afterward and how we did not get those jobs. 
Still, we sent out letters and conducted more endless tiring web searches. We tried not to mind the way our avatar's blood always swirled in the river in exactly the same patterns. We were always giving the same commands and offering the same reassurances when our avatars cried out and the flames danced and the beasts erupted and the fourth voices spoke into our headsets the way our fathers and boyfriends spoke, although of course they did not use the same words. And we tried not to mind how blind they were, as if they were looking at a different screen, a world where the sun shone and the grass swayed and the blacksmith belonged to them without question. She smiled and offered them her anvil and her hammer, offered newly minted shields and swords, offered her perfect breasts and muscular buttocks. It's true that sometimes we didn't think about the beasts behind the walls and under our feet, and it's true that we didn't talk about them, but it is also true that we never forgot them. The intercom did not buzz, but I came up the stairs anyway. I put on shoes and combed my hair and put on lipstick, even though it would leave a pink half moon on the rim of my water glass. It's so nice to meet you, he said, reaching out to shake my hand in a way that was not too hard or vigorous. I've heard so much about you, he said, and his eyes were as brown as the eyes of the blacksmith's donkey, who chewed grass through every death and could never be killed by the beasts or by anything. Thank you, I said, the way I'd said more times than I could count. It's nice to meet you, too. My mother fluttered her hands and untied her apron, and we sat down to eat her best lasagna. He sat in my father's chair, and he did not slouch like my father or rub his eyebrows, but sometimes his laugh was too loud in the way that my father's laugh was too loud, and sometimes his stories went on for too long, the way my father's stories sometimes went on for too long. And my mother and I laughed and listened and nodded as if we were not trying, we're not working to make him happy. I wondered about the simplicity of that lie, its commonness. I wondered what it would be like to go through a whole day not pretending, and if the discomfort would be worth it, and if it would even be possible. The sun was going down, and we looked out at the wide lawns, where there were no children or garden parties. The earth vibrated with the beasts doing the things they did, promising the violence they always promised. And I wondered what would happen if Ali, Tessa, and I set out with spears and shovels and lances, if we were as fierce as we were at the blacksmith's shanty, and if we hunted every monstrous body, skinned every scale, roasted the flesh so it sizzled, and gnawed the bones until we were greasy and sick. I wondered how long it would take us to fight them all, months or days or years, or maybe we would never fight them all. In my father's chair, the man chopped his salad and buttered his bread, and when he looked out at the lawns, he saw only promise and possibility, only things he could buy or build or own. If we did venture out with swords and chainsaws, he would only see crazy women hacking at nothing, only wild hair and rolling eyes, which is maybe what he saw as he sat polite and attentive at the table, if he saw anything other than the luster of our skin, the echoes of the other women he had known and would know. Thanks. Wow, thank you for that, um, for those beasts, man. Um, so Heiki Hotari in, in a past century attended a one room school school and spent summers on the for, on a forest fire lookout tire. He's a retired math professor and has published poems in numerous journals, including Crazy Horse Pleiades and the American Journal of Poetry, as well as in three collections. Heiki's chapbook Tooth and Shoe was published by Willow Springs Books as part of the Surrealist Poetry Series. And we lost Hickey a little bit ago, but it looks like he is back. And Hickey, you just want to um, unmute your, uh, your, yep, there you are. Mm -hmm. I will get out of the way. Thank you, Polly, Mark, and Sam. Uh, what happened is, is uh, Zoom froze, and it took me a long time to figure out what to do. It froze and then it warned me not to leave, but I finally did leave. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, first read the two poems uh, from Willow Springs. <clears throat> uh, the first one's called Have an Axis. And uh, to uh, give a little bit of background to it, uh, a top on the earth has a natural axis of rotation. Uh, there is it rotating. Uh, but not so in outer space. Anything you don't say can and will be used against you, will be, <laughs> will be used to benefit you. Are those doppelgangers replicas of you or do they walk around at night? The phantom hand will have as many fingers as are contemplated. 
any personage who can be made of ashes or of atoms can be animated, entertaining those not made of ashes or of atoms yet. Dissatisfied with only two degrees of rotation, simply have an axis be suspended briefly. How could one not be enamored of an angular momentum when the angular momentum's always watching? As in every state, a state of grace, in theory and in practice, you're a juicy, fruitful isotope and have as many midlife crises as you please. The difference of opinion paradox says truth is always halfway in between. You move the finish and you move the finish as it's easier to move the finish than the bleacher on which sits the queen. The next poem is, is called uh, Heat Seek. And a little bit of background. In 1962, at the National Future Farmers of America Convention, uh, I ran into two characters from the uh, mo uh, TV serial Gunsmoke in the wings of the stadium. Take a planet, leave a planet. Wanderers abound. There is a precipice in Gilead that only an unplanned event could love. You're fluent in three private languages. If you see Doc and Kitty in the wings in heavy makeup and your personality is printed on an IBM card, God will surely pay you to stand here, subvocalize, and hold your homemade vital sign. Good news, the bifurcation's nigh. You sleep to laugh, to see the bigger picture. There's that morning dove again. But if a rising tide lifts boats, how would boats know? How would they know they could but run aground? Where are your flying pigs? In orbit? If in orbit, where have their ellipses been? To love or be loved, you'll assign the heat seek vector a direction. Love is what you may have won already, but may carelessly have thrown the ornate envelope away. Uh, now I'd like to read um, a poem from uh, Tooth and Shoe, which Polly mentioned, uh, and from uh, the no then from the knowable emotions. And uh, I want to express my extreme gratitude to Chris Howell for making these two volumes possible. Uh, so the eponymous poem from Tooth and Shoe. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, there's a principle in logic uh, that uh, is translated loosely to English as from a contradiction, you can derive anything. And uh, so my contradiction is the concatenation of tooth and shoe, which are not supposed to go together. <clears throat> You might have nibbled on an earlobe when that earlobe and you both were soft and warm. But now when clowns collide, the comical atomic particles fly off in all directions. Now the universe is largely laughing matter. Guess which shoe the tooth is in, which tooth is in the shoe and which is tooth and which is shoe, and spin your web of ethics. Close your eyes 
and feel the dented fender. Be the dented fender. Be the dent. Okay. Next from the knowable emotions. A poem called Asymmetric. A bit of background. When Heloise's relatives discovered that Heloise and Abelard were studying more than the good book, they sent Heloise to the convent and Abelard was unmanned. At the other altar, Abelard says, now I don't. Therefore, what God has put asunder, let no man or woman or third person join. A hammer rotates, peen and claw and handle in slow motion by my window on the freeway. On the freeway, when a flower over one ear means a thousand nights of bliss, the other come within 10 feet of me and die. Next, I'm gonna read the first poem from uh, uh, my prize winning fourth collection. The poem is called, uh, and the collection is called Deja Vu Goes Both Ways. The poem is called La Brea. Now we're eating soup with Yuri Geller's spoons. There's many an intention tremor between saber tooth and natural asphalt, between birthday cake and fate. I hereby nominate these previously ordinary objects to be objects of affection. When one side is purely photogenic, one redeeming feature is behind each unmarked door. Some autonomic nervous system you have, blushing husband. When tectonic plates electrically rejuvenate you, you uh, will you have a dream of genie or a dram of manna or be good to go? I have a, a timer set, but I set it wrong. So I'm just kind of guessing here about how much time I've used. I, I think I'll read one more poem. This is uh, uh, one of my most recent poems written, I guess, the day before yesterday. It's called In Which I Kick the Tires. I, what I've been writing uh, recently, I'm calling velocity collages. Uh, the speed is part of it. And my weird thoughts are the other things that I'm pasting on the, in the lines. The data were so univocal, I didn't think to ask how univocal were they? I had both paths parametrized and cataclysms happened only in my absence. Now warts may be wings. The brevity humanity, the summer storm, the shadow and the dragonfly, the murder weapon, but an icicle and fingerprints and thermal mass. The icicle is not your enemy. The icicle is independent. One's a donor, one's anonymous. They're flying off the shelves as items as the other items simultaneously are enumerated, denigrated, and possessed. My lines of sight are intersecting at a point of order, Mr. Speaker, as in magnifying glasses, seconded emotions are not tabled. Zero is no absolute. 
My eyes are on the front side of my face. The former sergeant at arms is an FBI informant. Who will be the sergeant at arms now? Thank you very much. Thank you, Heike, that was wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, next up, we have Alison Hutchcraft. Um, she's a primarily a poet, I believe, Alison, yes. Um, she teaches creative writing at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and she's the author of Swale, which was published uh, by New Issues Poetry and, po and Prose this past October. Her poems have appeared in the Gettysburg Review, uh, same issue as the other two writers, um, Boulevard, Five Points, the Kenyan Review, and the Southern Review, among other journals. I'm quite looking forward to Allison's reading. I have not heard her read before, so everyone, please welcome Allison Hutchcraft. Thank you, Mark, um, and thank you, Polly and Sam, for bringing us together this evening, um, everyone for dropping in, and of course, to my brilliant fellow readers. Um, it's great to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to read um, my poem titled The Mermaids at Wikiwachi, which is in the latest Gettysburg Review, and also in my collection Swale, which recently came out. The Mermaids at Wiki Wachi. On distant ships, sailors once thought manatees mermaids. The way they raised their heads above the waves as if beckoning. Their silhouettes stained with sunlight and shadow. The manatees buoyant, suspended as they fed on shoal weed, water lettuce, musk and turtle grasses, all the tender prairies of the sea. Columbus in his journal thought, they are not so beautiful, remarking their faces had some masculine traits. Still, the image settles like a slick of oil on water a light silica sheen, the sea heavy with this iridescent skin. They are not so beautiful. Newt Perry knew this in 1947 when he opened his park at Wikiwachi Springs in the coastal hardwoods of segregated Florida where land was cheap and clogged with trash. He built his underwater theater into the spring's eye of light and trained his mermaids to hold their breath for minutes, gulping air from submerged hoses, which they clutched like umbilical cords. How they learned to perfect strings of subaqueous tricks, drinking bottles of grapette and snacking on bananas turning their bodies like slow moving Ferris wheels, rubber flippers hinged to their feet. Perry gave them the usual props, flashing mirrors and sequin tops, giant open clamshells over which they hovered like Venus in multiple, a castle where they could swim through every window. In those early days, the mermaids ran onto Highway 19 to call in the cars, the asphalt scalding their feet. On another coast, I watch a live stream on the Save the Manatee website and hope one will swim into the frame. The riverbed is a topography, like a drowned moor the sand abstracted, a thin covering of snow, over which manatees appear and dissolve, water grayed with haze and sluiced by stripes of sun. I think they must be hewn from moons, their massive bodies floating in this other sky, 
their backs marbled with moss and white boat inflicted scars, a language by which scientists tell them apart. Halos of bluegill huddle around their weight, nibble on algae, parasites, dead skin. A delicate slough before the rounded tails like giant rattan fans pulse out of view. Unmanned, the underwater camera cannot swivel for the best shot until all that's left is the muffled spring and patches of light on the water like sunken clouds from airplane windows. Weaky, watchy, little spring or winding river. The name the Seminole gave this place before those wars were waged, the terrible push to reservations, to landlock Oklahoma. There's so much I don't know. Not the black and white and technicolor prints snapped as training began. Not the mermaids to be who sat distracted on the wooden dock in bandeau suits, their hair curled to their shoulders, still pinned and dry. Not even the ruffle of weaky watchy waters in that long ago sunlight, or how the girls learned to smile underwater to show their teeth, the mid century still poised to begin. To reach disgust, you have to go deeper into history, find Victorian sketches of mermaids fashioned from animal parts, head and face of orangutan, upper body of baboon stitched to a king salmon's tail. Lately, biologists stitched together fins severed by fishing line and battering boat propellers, tick off sidings on coastal waters, threading migratory patterns like seams about to burst. Once I crossed a muddy field to watch turtles spawn on a beach, the grasses soaked in pre-dusk light, a cow knee deep at the edge of the scene and thought myself a spectacle. Once I paid a man to shuttle me from one tiny island to the next. And when we reached the islet covered in monkeys and leggy trees, he reached over the lip of the boat to offer a piece of fruit, and the closest monkey took it, my dutiful clapping filling up the lake. I was never like those girls at home in the water, so tan and long haired and glistening. But I learned to be alone with aloneness would wish every breeze take me under its swell, the sky scrubbed of clouds, the trees admonished when you caught them breathing. Now I can't stop thinking of what swallows everything, the desire for the world to be more than the world, the spring so clear and blameless in which animals drowned, and a diver surfaced triumphant, having pulled from the silty bottom the whitened jaw of a mastodon. Before the bluegills died off, the eelgrass killed by algae blooms, the brown sludge of developments ran off. A mermaid could float, held by the well of water blooming those hills still alive and green, like grasslands swallowed by sea, the sea a spring of glittering. When Wiki Wachi nearly closed, going belly up as the crowd stopped coming, it took a campaign to save them. Now articles proclaim the endangered mermaids have made a comeback are once again thriving. 
newly minted and touching up waterproof makeup, securing bikini strings. They no longer wear flippers, but have become the real thing, hoisting iridescent lycra tails over leg and torso, what every girl wants to be. Summers offer weekend retreats, sirens of the deep for women over 30, where they sing. For if I were a wiki watchy mermaid, everyone would be in love with me. First breath lessons, then poses while wielding that infamous tail, letting the current take up your hair. On Sundays, a closing ceremony and photo shoot, certificates and glossy prints. Florida's governor calls them a resource, like ore, lumber, natural gas, or groves of avocado trees, miles of pasture on which cattle graze. And it's true, the manatees reel in tourists with their siren song, call in droves for a chance to swim with the giants they call gentle. Sometimes, it's better as a wish. The audience wrapped, bound as if to masts on the other side of glass. As the spring clears its eddies and meadows and waiting for the bodies beneath to emerge for the show to begin. I can hear the sea cows singing each to each. We are underwater. I am taught to breathe and clap, smile and wish for another world. Can you feel how close it might be that someday the promise of everything? Thank you. All right, right on, thank you for that. Um, okay, so our next, our first two readers from Willow Springs were in the the issue that's about to come out, and then uh, you guys can order this now, and it'll be in your doorstep in a couple of weeks. Um, but our final reader is from the previous issue, uh, issue eighty six. I think you can see this. Um, and our final final reader is uh, Tom McCauley. Uh, Thomas McCauley is a writer, comedian, and musician whose work is has appeared in Superstition Review, Leveler, and What Rough Beast. His poem, People Are Not Lights, won the 2018 Joseph Langland Prize from the Academy of American Poets. In 2012, he scored Constance uh, Congdon's play, Tales of the Lost Formicans, for the Great Plains Theater Conference. And in 2018, he was a writer in residence at the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center of Nebraska City. Currently, he works for the nonprofit uh, AIM, AIM Institute and teaches contemporary literature at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, welcome, Tom McCauley. Thanks, Polly. Thanks, Polly and uh, Mark for running this and Sam for handling the technical stuff. And thanks to uh, Allison, Heike, Julie, Alicia, AD and Christine for being awesome readers. Okay. Introductory element, comma, independent clause, a study of the moon and bees. One, in the open parenthesis beside a conjunction, two commas nest. An independent clause on its way to the apiary spies them. Two direct objects of the mirror tested species, building a home in the branches of ascent. Two, somewhere a vacuum roars, Afternoon crickets crick in the ear. At night, when the world quiets down, every room vibrates deeply like a turbine, so that if you stand comma-wise on an otherwise blank page, a low moon throbs in your head. Replacing external sound with ceaseless inner noise is called tinnitus. Three. When the independent clause considers a comma, it pictures a bird lying on its side. Then, the unclear referent adds more noise. 
the click of a predicate against subject, or a suddenly desexualized wailing under the moon, after which we named the lunatics. Four, lunatic, from Latin, lunaticus, originally referred to diseases people ascribe to the moon. It's easy to blame things on the moon. For instance, madness, epilepsy, fever, rheumatism, tinnitus, often felt as an unending ringing, buzzing, chirping, whooshing, and or vibrating in the skull. And love, an unending same. Disease is thought to be because of the moon. Melanoma, sunburn. Six. Between 1765 and 1813, members of the Lunar Society of Birmingham called themselves lunatics. Who were they? A dinner club of industrialists, natural philosophers, intellectuals, illustrious figures, and other non-restrictive appositives in an age with little street lighting. It is no longer polite to call someone a lunatic. Trust me. Seven. Occasionally, let's say after no sleep, the buzz of tinnitus may be mistaken for bees. This has caused at least one independent clause, walking past a leaf that grazed his cheek to startle, suddenly cold in the summer, and look all around him for a predator. Eight. Anyone who's ever been stung knows politeness is not the domain of honeybees. The propolis they produce when mixed with wood gives redness to the violin. Nine, honeybees exhibit chronic despair after being shaken. Through pheromones and the dance language, honeybees invert this reaction to reintroduce a kind of prelapsarian bliss to the hive. Sad party is their grammar. Like the moon, they have grown less successful over time. They make fewer nutrients. They get harder to see in the dark. This is mostly our fault, we who invented the lightness. 10, the method of lunar distance. In celestial navigation, the angular distance between the moon and another celestial body. Combine this angle in a nautical almanac to calculate Greenwich Mean Time. By comparing your calculated time to local time, the navigator may determine longitude. Bees do something similar when they fan their wing pieces for landing. 11. The average ambient noise of cities has grown by about 30 decibels. Every three decibels represents a doubling of sound pressure. Cities are therefore 1,000 times louder than the soft, grassy world we knew before language. Long-term exposure to environmental noise may cause high blood pressure, headaches, insomnia, tinnitus, and hyperacusis, a kind of co colony collapse syndrome of the ear. Hyperacusis amplifies everyday sound. The clinking of silverware on a dinner plate may cause the sufferer's ear to spasm painfully. A lover's laughter may hurt purely for physical reasons. Semicolons keep various facts about the world from bumbling into one another. 12. Beethoven suffered from both tinnitus and hyperacusis. During the siege of Vienna, the unbearable loudness of faraway bombs drove him crying to his brother's basement, where the famous composer jammed pillows against his ear to stop himself from exploding. Several years earlier, he wrote the Moonlight Sonata. 13. Reading the ears may be a warning sign of glioblastoma, a rare and aggressive cancer born in the brain. Average age of onset is 64. In coronal MRIs, the tumor may resemble a hive. Mean survival time is three months without treatment. Treatment adds an additional nine to 12 months to this sentence. Imagine what you could do one year from now. 14. The wooden sign saying, do not shake the bees, is sad. How many bees had to be shaken for the dispassionate researcher to notice the chronic despair reaction, record it, and then puzzle over whether it was even worth mentioning? Sadder still, 
Think of all the people who will disobey a sign because it's there. 15. All things can be related to one another given enough semicolons in time, the careful combination of which may add up to one independent clause containing everything, magpies and manta rays, the only non-mammals who understand a mirror, Beethoven and honeybees, doomed musicians who ceaselessly buzz, the moon and other distances. This phenomenon, known as grammar, was invented many years ago by self-aware birds who lost their feathers and out of unquenchable necessity built loud hives in the grass called cities. According to laws these birds invented, every independent clause, no matter how complex, must end with a period, a question mark, or an exclamation point, the latter also known as a bang. 16. Ending an independent clause with an ellipsis is considered non-standard, ungrammatical, uncool, against the rules, implying as it does a wish not to end, to leave things unsaid, to return at some indefinable point to itself. 17, dot, dot, dot. 18, dear indispensable, unforgettable, independent clause, please do not shake the bees. Sincerely, the moon. Thank you. All right. So thanks, Tom. That was fantastic. Um, and uh, readers, that was just amazing. I'm thinking that it would be best if we all switched over to gallery view and showed our faces so that um, people could see us while they were asking questions. And we'll open up. The Q&A is open. And so um, audience, if you have any questions, um, either type them in the Q&A or ask, or, or ask to speak a question and we'll turn your mic on so that you can ask the question yourself and you can ask of any of the, any of the panelists. And so, yeah, let's open it up. And it does look like people can write in the chat, but it'd be better if you put your questions in the Q&A so we can find it, find them. Sam, you seeing anything? And oh, we have um, Facebook, uh, sorry, we have uh, YouTube Live also. So Sam, are you seeing anything over there? Um, no questions yet. Okay. We're getting great comments in the, in the um, chat, chat. I feel like a, like a news announcer and now we're seeing <laughs> comments in the chat. <laughs> Any questions, anyone? I actually do have one. Um, Tom, I, I just want to ask you about tintinitis because I'm assuming that's part of what spurred this wild essay. Could you talk about that? Um, well, yeah. Um, so I've been a musician since I was like 13 or 14 and, you know, lots of too many shows and practices without earplugs can result in tinnitus. Um, so it was a very difficult thing when I first got it at like age 18. I kind of stopped playing music for a while and then I was like over protecting my ears, um, which caused hyperacusis, which is like way worse, which is like the loud, you know, like silverware clinking on dishes in another room would be like unbearable. Some people have it so bad that like they end up committing suicide, which luckily did not happen with me. Um, and it was, I mean, but it's like your, it's your tolerance for environmental noise collapses basically. And um, because sounds are painful, like you protect yourself more, but then that like perpetuates it. So the way to get over it is to like slowly reintroduce sound to your world. And, you know, after a few years, hopefully that's gone. I mean, I still have tinnitus, but it doesn't bother me anymore. It actually kind of helps me fall asleep now which is quite the change. I actually kind of forget that I ever even had like hyperacusis, but it was like a real big deal for a while. So um, I don't know if that spurred, I think it was, 
It was spurred really by a, an assignment that I had at the University of Massachusetts where I was supposed to like imitate another writer in the class. Um, I failed that part, but like it led me to something else. Um, so that was cool. But I, I don't know why, I guess, I guess my tinnitus was maybe like spiking at that point. So I was probably re, like probably putting that in there. Um, Cause I was like staying up too late grading papers occasionally and that's what makes it worse. But um, yeah, if anybody has tinnitus and they hate it, don't worry, you know, you, you'll get better. So, thank you. We have um, one question from Panina. And uh, I think if I hit answer live, you can come and ask it with your video. Um, or maybe not. Here, I'll just read it. Um, uh, so the question is for um, Julia Alicia. Um, she says, I really enjoyed your story. I'm curious as to your thoughts about the GameStop short. Thanks. That's a really fun question. And I would actually love to hear other people's thoughts on this too. Um, so I think as a gamer type person, the thing that I always kind of appreciate about gamers is the, the sort of sense of trying to creatively collaborate and um, work around things. You know, gamers are always trying to work the system or figure out the secret or find the, 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 the way to do something that maybe the, the developers or the designers didn't think of. And so I feel like this is, I, I would never have guessed that this would happen, but I'm, I'm really been enjoying um, watching it. It's fascinating to me. Any other questions? Everybody's just speechless, I'm assuming. <laughs> yes. Does anybody on the panel have GameStop stock? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have one. Uh, we've got a bunch. Um, Christine Schott, thank you for articulating the machismo doctor with answers. How does your experience of the medical system contradict your ideas about healing and about the healing work of language? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a, a challenging question. Um, it's kind of interesting because I think as a writer, um, like your first instinct is to use your writing as therapy to like heal yourself. Um, and that was probably the best um, advice I got from my, uh, one of my mentors at Converse was, your writing is not therapy. Um, so your, your, your own language is not going to heal you and you don't tend to write a very good essay until you have a kind of perspective on your own physical experience that um, you can come at it from a different direction, not, uh, not in the process of healing. So actually that's part of the essay later on is um, it took me a really long time after recovery before I was able to write um, that essay. Um, and as far as, you know, sort of doctor's use of uh, language as, as a way of kind of communicating your own healing to you, I have not found that to be particularly articulate. Um, one of the other things that I can com complain about, you know, in my essay is that um, they didn't ever tell me what was going on. Um, you know, they, they just treat you and, and you're like, well, what did you do? And, and they're like, oh, we just did this thing. And um, uh, at one point after my uh, collarbone had to be um, repaired by surgery. And uh, a week later, I went back for a, a checkup and I was like, my, my shoulder blade is killing me. And they go, oh yeah, we drilled a hole in it. And I'm like, did you maybe want to tell me? So um, the, and, and I also have to be fair, like the doctors did put me back together and I'm very grateful for that. But like their, um, their physical interaction with me was healing, but the way they verbally interacted with me was not. Um, and so I think that's kind of where the heart of that essay is, um, is, is in that contradiction. Uh, it looks like you have another question to Christine 
so don't don't go away yet. Um, Carling Ramsdell says I'm all I am also absolutely obsessed with medieval lit, and I love the references you make to Beowulf in your essay. Can you talk more about your relationship with medieval lit, the way it enters your daily life, and how you use it in your creative nonfiction and in other writing? Uh, how much time do we got? <laughs> um, no, uh, I, I am by training a medievalist. Um, that, that is my primary job uh, as a teacher, and also my primary research is in medieval literature. And so um, I am obsessed with Beowulf and absolutely love that poem and impose it upon every student I possibly can, whether they like it or not. Um, and so I think it's, it's more that because that's my, my research field as an academic, um, it seeps into um, my creative writing. I, I write a lot of you know, historical fiction and um, it sort of elbowed its way into that essay. Originally the essay had nothing to do with um, Anglo-Saxon language or anything like that. Um, but then I just, I came across that term, the Bonhoos, the bone house. I was like, yes, that, that's the key to this, to trying to tell this story. Um, and so what I'm kind of contemplating now is a project that like ties um, some of the essays that I'm working on to these sort of fossils in our language of, of these, um, these beautiful kennings and, and other elements of the Anglo-Saxon language that, that survive into to modern English. So, thank you. Sorry, I just saw the question about um, Rhea Headley's Beowulf translation. <laughs> um, I have not read it. Um, I am an enormous fan of retellings and um, her, her retelling of, of Beowulf, a modern Beowulf, Mere Wife is a really amazing novel, but I haven't read the translation. So no comment yet. Okay. I just wanna make a comment that the last two pieces, I thought it was so fascinating how, um, uh, Allison's was was a poem, but it read like an essay, and Tom's was an essay, and it read like poetry. I thought that was super cool. Yeah, I, I agree, Polly. I thought I thought that was a nice um, serendipitous moment um, between both those essays, and there was you know some lovely themes running, interestingly, through all of these pieces. Um, but I was wondering, Allison, could you talk a little bit about the, you know the inspiration for the merging of the information about the manatees with the history of the the wiki mermaids and sort of how how that poem sort of developed absolutely thank you mark um yeah i, I don't usually write um multi-page poems um, that is the only time i've ever written something so long most poems are you know, just a good old lyric, you know, one, two pages. Um, but I, um, I wrote that poem, it was unexpected. I didn't plan to be writing about it. Um, I've never been to Wikiwachi Wiki Springs um, and I don't spend a lot of time in Florida. Um, but I, uh, I started writing that poem um, when I was in a, at a three and a half month residency um, in coastal Oregon in a very rural place. And I was spending a lot of time um, in a environment that is the opposite of Florida, like Northwestern environment. And um, I was reading and writing poems about um, a lot of different animals from the Northwest, including um, the stellar sea cow, which is an extinct creature, one that kind of infamously went extinct very quickly once humans arrived. And um, the sea cow is sort of like a giant manatee, um, one that lived in cold water. Um, and so strangely reading a lot about Stellar who, um, who kind of discovered the sea cow who it's named after um, led me to manatees. And I, I love, I deeply love um, doing lots of research for poems, whether they are the short lyrics or this one longer poem. And so it became this sort of long kind of collage where I was thinking about um, a lot of different things, um, that history, um, the, the strange, I love looking at images. I actually pulled out images that I had kept um, on my wall in that residency from, uh, a, you know, manatee <laughs> and um, you know these really bizarre kitschy 
um, uh, photographs from Wikiwachi. I don't know if anyone can see that, but these great, um, totally bizarre worlds of them having like an underwater theater um, in the 40s and it still exists now. So I'm not sure why it took hold of my imagination, but once I was in it, I kept going. <laughs> and uh, um, I'm so so happy, Mark, that um, the poem found a found a home in the Gettysburg. Yeah, I like between your poem and Tom's piece. I liked. I really enjoyed the interplay of the, you know, the human worlds, the natural world, the inner, you know, the interplay between the two of them, the depredations that inevitably occur occur and I thought that was really wonderful the way that both of you kind of worked those elements while also working in this really fascinating you know factual information these little tidbits that just keep the keep both pieces you know lively just enough right just to, just enough to keep them sort of mysterious and uh, and intriguing so thank you both for those pieces Thank you, that's really good insight. And yeah, I, I love Allison's piece. In fact, I am buying the latest issue of Getting Again, again I'm so sorry that we, we, we are out of print copies, but yes, the digital of that issue is available. It's yeah. cheaper anyway, and I moved to a city that's really expensive, so like. It's so, so the digital's work. Are there any other, does anybody have any other, do, do panelists, do you all have questions for each other? I mean, you know. All right, if you have a question, throw it in the chat. That's the easiest, or so, sorry, throw it in the, um, in the uh, Q&A. That's the easiest place for us to see it, it looks like. I was just curious, as anybody's writing practice, how has the pandemic affected that? Um, do, you find, do you find yourselves writing more or less or what? I mean, <laughs> it's a played out question, but I'm a played out dude. No, um, I don't know. I find like I'm not writing as much as I would like to, but I have access to such writing all the time. So I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. It's a good question and a tricky one for sure. I. I myself find that there are a lot of underwater springs in all this, but sometimes it takes me longer to get to them. But they're deeper when I get there. That's awesome. Looks like we have a um, question for uh, A.D. Nauman. Um, Dylan asked, what sort of research did you have to do for your piece? Well, lately I've, I have been getting into writing historical fiction. Right now I'm writing a novel about um, set during the Great Depression. But for this particular piece, um, for lookers, I, I had lived in the area and I knew about this, um, th this was based on an actual radio station and one of their promotions was the Good Lookers campaign. So I knew that that did actually exist and it was sort of easy to imagine from there. Uh, and, I, and I did meet at one point a, a, a DJ who formed the basis for the DJ Big D. So this was actually a, a radio station promotion in the late 70s. I guess that's all I'll say. 
And we did get um, a pan, uh, attendee who who would like to make us all whiskey sours if they could. And uh, and Andrew Furman gave everybody a, a great job, thumbs up. I, it, the message disappeared before I got a chance to get it word for word. But and I, Andrew's in the previous issue of of uh, Willow Springs, so really nice to hear from him. And Gettysburg too. Yeah. So there's there's some nice overlap. Um, yeah. between there are two publications, our coastal, our quote coastal pubs, although we're not close enough to the coast, I guess, here in Gettysburg. We aren't either. We're okay. six. <laughs> we can't smell the ocean from Gettysburg. No. no. Um, I do have one more question for, for Hakey, uh, uh, because I've read all your stuff on the page and it was so uh, nice to hear you read it out loud. And I just wonder the, about the process or, or about what it means for you to hear it. Um, what you're hearing. I don't know how else to ask that. Well, uh, it, it's all auditory for me. Uh, I speak a lot before I write. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's like I'm singing. And uh, uh, sometimes I'm singing a song that I know wrong. And uh, and I find that very delightful <laughs> to uh, to to get it wrong. That's how I did mathematics too, and uh, was very successful because of of hearing it wrong, getting it upside down, etc. Great. Hmm. All right. Well, I think that's it. We're not seeing any more. Um... Uh, thank you all for coming. This was fantastic. We are having a little um, Zoom gathering afterwards. If you know one of the panelists or and you don't have an invitation, just email us and say, please send me an invitation. I want to go to that. Um, and we're going to you know, start up in about 15 minutes when people have a chance to get their whiskey sours and whatever else it is that they would like to get or their water and cheese. Um, and thank you all for coming. This was really, really, really fun. Readers, that was just fantastic. It's just, um, and Mark, thanks for, thanks for joining us and Lauren and uh, Sam for running the, the board. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thank you again, Polly. Thank you, Sam. Um, again, thanks to all the readers. This was quite fun and we should do it again. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. It actually looks like we have one late question. Oh, and, hey, here we go. Yeah, so, um, I'm going to actually see if I can, I can turn on his video. Cause okay, Ben, you should be allowed to talk now. Oh, can you hear me? Hey, yeah. So this is a, a question for AD. So I, I was wondering what kind of parallels do you see between the process of writing a dystopian novel like Scorch and you said you're currently working on a historical project that's set during the Great Depression. So do you find there are common threads that pull you through both of those very different types of fiction? Uh, that's a terrific question. Uh, and the common thread in, in these particular two novels would be, um, the effects of capitalism on on how we live our lives, um, but I mean it, it, it's interesting. So I wrote the dystopian novel. It was published in two thousand one. In a weird way, it was a little bit ahead of the dystopian trend, um, and I I found that it seems like more readers. Or there's a there's a there's a larger readership that wants to to connect with more realistic and historical venues or themes. Um, dystopians can be pretty rough, so in a way, in a way, what I'm writing now is sort of a happy dystopian <laughs> novel. It's it's because there's some element of nostalgia in it. But um, the theme that really runs through most of my work is how unregulated capitalism um, affects human beings.
Hickey, do you know a Dylan? Yes, I, I, uh, I just attempted to answer his question privately, uh, but uh, uh, he, he uh, greeted me in Finnish and I, <laughs> I'm, I haven't really studied Finnish, so I, di I didn't know what he was saying. Uh, <laughs> do, do you wanna, um, Sam, do you wanna turn Dylan on for, to, to let him uh, give, a, give a comment? Yes. Okay, Dylan, one sec. He's been raising his hand a bit. We're just, um, uh, well, the reason we do the webinar format is to prevent Zoomers. So we, we just want to know who, who, who we want to know that you're not going to Zoom bomb us. Dylan, no, you are able to talk if you would like. I think he's gone. Perhaps not. No, he says no. Just sue me for great poems. Yeah, I just saw that on the <laughs> on the uh, uh, chat uh, Q and A. <laughs> awesome. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Bye.